I've also sort of, as you can see, I've also jazzed it up a little bit to have lots of references to the movie Back to the Future. And I, how many of y'all have seen the movie Back to the Future? Okay, almost everyone. I noticed a couple of people today who are wearing jackets and they have the open sleeves, uh, which you can remember Michael J. Fox in the movie had. And I was teasing Jason Weldon too. He did the same thing over the weekend. And I said, uh, hey kids, you junk ship? <laughs> What's the little life preserver? <laughs> that was one of my favorite lines because in the 1980s, that's what we did. I had to explain it to our kids when we showed it to them. <laughs> uh, I, also, I also am working in the Back to the Future theme for several reasons. Well, uh, one of them for a pop culture reference, you'll notice Vladimir Putin uh, replacing it. No, I'm not that good at Photoshop. Uh, somebody else had put this together. Uh, but I also wanted to connect this to uh, the work of Professor Stephen M. Walt, who I will get to in a little bit, uh, his context. So this is kind of the overview slide, letting you know what to expect. We'll look a little bit at East Europe's historical legacy. We'll talk about how many of these countries in Central and East Europe shifted from right wing to left wing. We get to the freedom for the region after the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is a very exciting time. And this is where I, I come in as a, as a college student uh, visiting East Europe at the time, some of the places that you'll be going to. Uh, then I, I have some not so good news, which is what has happened to East Europe ever since? Because <clears throat> after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we kind of, kind of almost forgot about the region. And yet it's amazing to, when you take a look at it, when you step back and you see the big picture, you'll get to see that a lot of what happened to East Europe when they shifted to the right wing, when they shifted to authoritarianism, the same things that happened to them back in the 1930s have happened to them over the last decade. I mean, it's uncanny, thus the back to the future. What's next for them? And then finally, uh, a little bit on the Slovakia solution. I'll try to go uh, a little quicker because I really am just as interested in the questions you have and feel free also to make observations. That's okay. It's, it's fine. You can do that. Uh, and then something for others to comment on. Because I always feel like that, that's what makes a classroom better, is not just one person talking, but a lot of different people. I'll ask a few questions, but don't hesitate uh, jumping on me. Okay. Professor Stephen Wall uh, wrote from Back to the Future, World Politics Edition, in the uh, magazine Foreign Policy in 2015. And he pointed out, we always have these stressful exams, like the big final exam. Uh, I think ours were called comprehensives. Sometimes it's prelims. It's a very jarring experience for a lot of people. And he said the toughest question that they asked out there was, has international politics really changed much over the last, um, you know, the last few decades, even the last few centuries? What's really new? Or are we just sort of falling into the cycle that went over and over again? How much of this is something we've never seen before, which is what we thought was happening in 1989 and 1990? And how much of this is, uh-oh, we're going back into history? So that's the question I want you to think about. You never, I never find the perfect map. I really should figure out how to like, do geographic maps so I can get them right. But these are generally two of the better maps from this time. <coughs> And I, if you really wanted to, I mean, if you, uh, if you had a history professor, they would start much earlier for East Europe. But uh, political scientists, there's a joke that says, we think the world started in 1816. <laughs> you know, so that makes us different from uh, whether it's evolution or creationism. And the reason we think the world started in 1816 is it was after the Napoleonic era. And that's when we begin a lot of our data collection efforts, is in 1816. Uh, so I'll start from the 1800s and move to the present. Political scientists, are a little different from historians. I mean, so, you know, oftentimes we go back for historical analogies, but this is where the big data comes in. And the Europe before World War I, you remember, it's a, it, it's, you know, it's a history of empires. You know, lar a few large countries, empires dominating Europe. You remember this, you know, Prussian Empire, German Empire, Anyone, can anyone think of any of the other empires from that time? Russia. Oh yeah, the Russian Empire. Definitely, and that's how they would see themselves, you know, the Imperial Russia. Any others? Habsburgs. Yes, the Habsburgs. Who were they in charge of? Yeah. The Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, believe it or not, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they recognized that some of the people under them were minorities. 
or were different from their nationality. They, so they didn't say everyone is Austro-Hungarian or we're all Austrians here. They recognized that they were subjugating another people. I went to a conference in Tampa when I was a graduate student in the 1990s, and I kid you not, there was a uh, person who given a presentation about how Austria saw the peoples that they governed. And they classified the peoples that they governed by what animal they were most similar to. I kid you not. They were, oh, the Serbs, they are the wolves. You know, uh, so-and-so group, they are, the, they are like the bears, they are like the... I mean, and they basically had a human, a human form with an animal head. And that was their classification system for the peoples that they were in charge of. So they didn't always see them as less. This would be highly politically incorrect today. <laughs> but even then, it was very shocking to all of us. So you have the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You've got the Prussian Empire, which morphed into Germany. The Russian Empire. Any other game? Oh, yeah, British. You know, what's the old phrase in the 1800s? The sun never sets on the British Empire. It dominating the world, colonial over. Any others? We're France, they are. <laughs> Most of us have been a generation where France was on a losing streak rather than a winning streak. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, my, my son's watching the New England Patriots. He's only known the New England Patriots to win games, and he forgets that there was a time where you know, they were the model of incompetence. <laughs> they, had to, they had to use a snow plow to plow an area just to win a field you know, game by a field goal. <laughs> so even then, they were using trickery. <laughs> I love sports references, as do my students. But yeah, we have the French Empire as well. Any others? Any trivia experts out here go to Mighty Joe's Pizza on Thursday night? Another big empire. They had a piece of uh, Europe, but they were mostly an empire in Western Asia. Oh, the Ottoman Empire. My wife likes a TV show called The Tech. It's a spoof of superheroes. And one of the enemies they have to fight is the Ottoman Empire and its animatronic furniture that try to take over the world. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, you've got, they dominated each other. So when you think about it, there weren't that many countries during that time. You were either subjugated by somebody else as part of an empire or you ran an empire. And World War I broke that up. I mean, it, it was, uh, you know, it was not the first ever global conflict, but it was the, the, the first one big enough to be called the global conflict or a world war. In fact, uh, my, my grandparents had a set of encyclopedias that were published in 1920, and of course they referred to everything as the Great War. They don't talk much about World War II for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's the entry, and I even did a little something where I had like a little ruler, as a, even, even then I was like a quantitative geek. And I was like measuring, you know, counting pages and measuring column space, and the Great War dominated just about, it was the largest entry in this encyclopedia. I mean, it was that much in people's mind. I mean, all kinds of uh, new ways of fighting, the sheer death toll, the sheer destruction, mechanization, and people thought, wow, this was, even though it lasted only four years. I mean, the Hundred Years War has not beat by, uh, what, 96? <laughs> but it, certainly the death toll from this, it was such a jarring experience. So how did the world, what did the world do, or the, the, the allied powers, I should say, the winning side, what did they do after World War I? That's partly right. <laughs> what did they do before they did nothing? They partitioned everything and people out to work Okay, yeah, they broke up some of these empires. They felt that having an empire was a bad thing. Woodrow Wilson, you know, it said, we must make the world safe for democracy. The idea was if we made the democracies wouldn't fight each other, people wouldn't vote for something this destructive. Only kings and emperors would do something like this. Or czars or... Uh, you know, some of the other you know, fancy titles, sultans and stuff. Only those kinds of people would do things. So if we broke up these empires, we should have less conflict. That was the thinking. And the Brits and the French and the Italians and others on the winning side, they found special ways to carve it up to make sure their enemies would never be strong again, right? And so the Austro-Hungarian Empire was broken up completely. Germany lost major territory. Uh, the Russians lost a lot of territory. Some of that is... They, they threw in the towel in 1918 and they lost some of the territory that way. But all over, parts of the, the country, and that's where you see the formation of Central and East Europe in these new countries that were created. And they figured these small countries, you know, you wouldn't see, 
you wouldn't see a rise of a new world war because everybody was smaller than, of course, the British Empire, the French Empire, <laughs> maybe the Italians. They wouldn't be much of a threat. They'd be carved up. And plus, if we made them somewhat more democratic, this would improve things, right? That was the thinking. Nobody ever wanted this war to happen again. And certainly not the same actors that would rise again. Now, why didn't that work? Well, go ahead. What was your answer? I, was like, I knew I'd get around to you again. Why didn't that work? It was not enough work in there. It wasn't built up enough. I don't think we did enough. The United States apparently didn't do enough. Okay. Yeah. You were right when you said do nothing. After they did something, then we did nothing. <laughs> we may have done too much. And yet, the United States withdrew from the playing field, which might have been not only a pretty strong country, but a good role model. What else was created during this time? Something was designed to protect all countries. A League of Nations. Okay, that sounds really good. And it was designed to protect everyone would join this alliance. And it has a solution to the old way of empire versus empire. They said, if one country attacks another, Everyone gangs up on the aggressor. Nobody would ever want to fight. It would create the fear of attacking someone. So, did it work? Not work? Not good work. It fell apart. It did. It, I mean, it had a good decade in the 1920s. It was able to solve some conflicts, let's say, between Greece and Turkey, uh, between Sweden and Finland. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't ready for a major power that was ready to be. We just knew it could handle the minor stuff. It's kind of like the Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, they, they, they can now dominate the minor ones, but they, they beat so very quickly. But yeah, and now you have a lot of small countries, maybe too small to defend themselves. And then what happens when, when there's an aggressor? Three R's happen in the 1930s. This uh, boring professor who I keep saying, oh no, it can't be like that. Uh, he's talking about the Smoot Hawley Tariff Act. What happened was countries were like, oh my gosh, international trade is to blame. We'll put massive taxes on everyone else's trade. So trade ground to a, a standstill. A large country like the United States can probably get away with it. It certainly <coughs> didn't help. It may have worsened the Great Depression for us. You can imagine if you're a small country that's not so self sufficient how devastating this would be to East Europe. So it wrecked the economies of these new countries. Suddenly, authoritarians from the East, first the communists under Joseph Stalin, you know, become a powerful force. And many of these East European countries, some of them had either fought or been under the thumb of Russia, are getting pretty nervous as Stalin builds the Soviet empire. So your economy is gone. You face a threat from abroad. People think that the Nazis took over everybody, but that's not exactly the case. On this map, you can see, maybe, it looks a little different here, it's a little clearer, but nevertheless, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria 
teamed up with the Nazi government. They elected their own far-right regimes. They were terrified of communism. They were terrified of the Soviets. And they felt like they needed a strong ally. The League of Nations could not provide that. The United States couldn't be there for them. Adolf Hitler, who promised to stand up to communism, becomes the next best model. And so many of these countries willingly signed an alliance. Forced into it. Not everybody thought that uh, Hitler was such a great person. Some decided to try and stand up to him. Like Czechoslovakia. Anybody know what happened there? Yeah, they got crushed. <laughs> I don't know if they got militarily crushed. I mean, one of the benefits of y'all going to see Prague, those who are going on the trip, is, I mean, Prague was not destroyed during World War II. So what ha if they didn't get flat, what happened? Does anybody know specifically? Part of it got seceded to Germany after the lands. Yeah. Who did that, by the way? The British. Ah, Western countries. So the, the, the last ones who could protect them, Britain and France, gave over Czechoslovakia over to uh, Hitler, or at least part of Czechoslovakia. And when he moved in troops over the rest of the country, nobody stood up for, the, you know, for Czechoslovakia, which pretty much lets you know where we were going to be. How about Austria? What did Austria do during this? I mean, <laughs> you're, you've gone from Austro-Hungarian empire to uh, a nice ski resort. Okay, that's an exaggeration, but still, I mean, Austria was not a powerful country anymore. You know, they, they fear stuff from abroad, and um, they wonder. As a little kid, I was at, uh, my mom always made sure every time around uh, Easter time, we would watch The Sound of Music. And it was like one of the few times mom would allow us to wheel in the TV and watch it uh, while we were eating. And I kept thinking, I was like, why are they doing this? Why are they just like giving in to Nazis? Well, now we know that they're bad. But back then, I guess they thought, you know, threats from abroad, a bad economy. Hitler seems to have a good economy, and he's standing up to communism. We'll go with him. And so that's what you saw in these countries. Those who would stand up to him, like Czechoslovakia, relied on alliances or understandings from Western countries who didn't come to their aid, who even gave it away. Anybody else in East Europe we haven't covered yet? Poland fought. Yeah. So the start of World War, the start of World War II in Europe at least is September 1st, 1939, when Hitler attacked Poland. Was that it? That was the start. What? That was the start. That was the start of it. Anybody know what else happened to Poland? Russia. Hitler was attacking from the west. Russia. Russia attacked from the east under an understanding from Hitler. So this shows what happens if you try and stand up for yourself. I mean, maybe American students today may not know these lessons, but keep in mind that the people who you'll be visiting, they have a pretty strong sense of history. They're pretty aware of what happens when you try and stand up to somebody or when you rely on someone else for help. Nineteen forty-five. Why, why do all these countries suddenly become communists? Does anybody know? Almost all of East Europe becomes communist. These countries we talked about: Poland, Czechoslovakia, <coughs> Hungary, and the others in the Balkans. Iron curtain. Yeah. What? How does the Iron Curtain work? Oh, the three great powers both of them, and they divided up the power of the mm -hmm. territory. When they were attacking the Germans and pushing them back. They brought their soldiers along. The soldiers never left. <laughs> and America was not ready yet for World War III. And so at conferences like at Yalta and at Potsdam, the understanding was the Soviets were going to be in charge of this region. And this is another lesson for East Europe to learn. <coughs> you know, there, are many, there are many people in the East Europe who were embittered by the fact that nobody stood up for them or nobody negotiated on their behalf. And, but nobody was ready for World War III. It was, uh, World War II was very bloody. You know, lots of people died. You know, crushed the economy. America was like running out of money. And we had a terrible recession afterwards. It's not a good time. Some of these countries rose up in rebellion. Hungary in 1956. East Germany in 1953. Czechoslovakia in 1968. Anybody know much about the Hungarian uprising? 
How much of The Coke bottle was gasoline down in the tank. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with this thing. Hungary's leader, uh, Emre Nagy, decided that the country would break away from the Soviet alliance, the Warsaw Pact. He didn't say he was going to be fully democratic or free market or something like that, but that, that was problem enough. And so the Soviets rolled in the tanks, and there was a popular uprising. You know, many of the Hungarians rose up to defend themselves. And they fully expected the uh, United States to come help bail them out. Not good to do this during an election, by the way. <laughs> our, our planes moved up into Germany. I mean, you know, we were prepared on the border, but you know, the, the uprising was not popularly supported. They felt that you know, Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles, who had given a lot of anti-communist rhetoric, they probably thought the United States and Western countries would come to their aid or do something to stop the invasion. Such actions were vetoed in the United Nations. These countries did not send individual aid. They took in refugees from Hungary, but that's about it. And thousands died. Well, the, the view at that time was Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, they were still the animals, and the Western countries, it was the same with Poland, like right? Britain, and we didn't really give Poland the help they needed during the war. They were looked on as second-class peoples. That could be one explanation. In 1968, when the, um, the Czech leader, Dubček said, you know, we would have socialism with a human face. It would not be as authoritarian. He was removed from office. And anyone who supported such a move, they were rounded up. The Prague Spring, I guess, uh, came to a halt. And this time, the Russians also got other East European countries to go in, you know, and help put, put down any sort of rebellion. 1980, the Solidarity Movement, trade unions who were uh, Believe it or not, that started about uh, poor uh, safety conditions for dock workers in Gdansk. You know, and that was huge. The West would always provide moral support and maybe some clandestine help or aid, but very little over, you know, overt support. And so, East Europe learned that again. I, I promise, I, I, I trust me, I have a lot more pictures, and uh, a lot of the pictures are the nice buildings, the wonderful things you'll see, clocks, castles, you name it, all kinds. Uh, it's taken on a 110 camera, so it's not, I mean, that's like the little store-bought cameras you can have, and so uh, the quality is not so good, so I'm not showing those. I'm showing you pictures of probably what you would have only seen at the time in East Europe, so political stuff. And keep in mind, I was political science minor thinking about being a major. Uh, this is on the border of Czechoslovakia and Austria. It's the remnants of the, uh, the Iron Curtain, so to speak. There were, the large fences have been taken down, but the guard posts were still there. And the communists were still in charge of Czechoslovakia when we went through. And uh, they, they gave our vehicles the third degree. I mean, they opened everything. They were looking for everything. We had a long list of things we could and could not take. Some were so uh, humorous that I sent it off to uh, my favorite late night show, David Letterman, so he could work it into a top 10 list. I don't know. We didn't have the internet, so I don't know if it ever made it, but the list was so ridiculous, I mailed it off to New York City <laughs> to have them make fun of that. But yeah, they, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of, I remember the ones where it was like, no enamel bathtubs and no beekeeping stuff. And I'm, I'm imagining opening up the suitcase, the bees all take off. <laughs> Where were we going to, you know, we we're trying to tell them, I'm sure they didn't speak English, they're like, no, no, we don't have any enamel bathtubs in here. <laughs> yeah, they were looking for, I remember another one said, no, no bicycles. Like, you couldn't take bicycles. And the guy rode through on a bicycle, the guards waved to him. I was like, I'm no Sherlock Holmes, but <laughs> moving a little bit off bicycle. There was, a, uh, there was a country that you saw a great difference of wealth. You get to see the horse-drawn cart full of hay you know, in Hungary, and uh, near the hotel we stayed at, all the fancy sports cars in 1990. So there's a big gap. Many of the old communist leaders kind of morphed into <coughs> capitalists overnight. You know, the businesses that they, you know, they were the only ones who could afford to buy the factory. You know, they had all the money. 
kind of like being the banker in Monopoly when you're a kid. <laughs> Give yourself a few low interest loans. <laughs> but yeah, all these countries were you know, under the Soviet. Even ones like Yugoslavia that broke away, they still maintain communism. Uh, same thing with Albania. Al there was still a heavy Soviet presence there. You know, gravesite to uh, Soviet gravesite to someone who was battling the, rev uh, the revolutionaries. A Soviet tank up on a, which is, it's not a mausoleum, but you know, some sort of facade or structure. Uh, we even had the, uh, the Russian army started marching through. Well, they were still the Soviet army. They went marching through. This is uh, near the presidential palace, the White House in Czechoslovakia. And they were marching through just to let everyone know who was still boss before they had to officially leave. It was hard to find, it was hard to find, um, it, it was hard to find something that showed signs of the West. You know, even then, if somebody put up posters, they got torn down. And it, it, it was an optimistic college student. I was looking for everything. Oh, all these people we heard about, Lech Walesa, you know, Václav Havel or something like that. You know, running around looking for those. They were very hard to find. So one of my favorite, so I, I wanted to take it down, but I thought, oh, these posters have a much better use in Czechoslovakia. But I took a picture of Václav Havel. He was a, a playwright who had been imprisoned by the communists because some of his uh, material questions the authority. And he became the first free leader of Czechoslovakia. He became president of the country. And so rather than tear down the poster, took a picture of it. I don't know. If it was like North Korea times, that could be dangerous tearing down posters. <laughs> I want to show you a little picture of Pilsner. As you can see, it doesn't look like a really nice architectural thing. I got admit as a college student, we were going to Pilsner. I was like, oh, we're going to Pilsner. This sounds like a great place for a college student to go to. <laughs> Woo! Not as happy as you would think. Uh, a lot of these, you know, the, the Soviets, the Czech uh, communist government, they would build these huge apartment structures. Wow, we get new modern buildings. But they had dusk to dawn curfews. And, you know, if you were out after dusk, well, then you're like a subversive. And so it wasn't as happy a place as you thought. And it wasn't like, I mean, freedom was coming, but it wasn't like everyone was jumping up and down, joyous. They were sort of like, you're kind of waking up from a bad dream and you're just happy it's over. That's how we describe the people who kills them. Got to admit, I was really optimistic. I mean, even with that, it was very exciting to, to, to meet people, to see freedom coming to these areas. How many of you remember this era? The fall of the Berlin Wall. Okay, we've got that, you know, structures coming down in East Europe, people able to come over, families being reunited, people being able to vote in elections for the first time. People who would push against communism are the ones who win the elections. It was a very optimistic time. 1989-1990. And I kept thinking like, like, wow, I'm standing here in history. History is changing forever. In some ways, it was even more exciting because some you know, in this country, you got to we take democracy and being in a republic for granted. Over there, this was, uh, I mean, this was something to treasure. It was so exciting being there. I mean, you could just feel it. Even, I mean, some of the smaller towns like Pilsner, maybe it was a little harder, but the bigger cities like Warsaw and uh, Prague, Bratislava, Budapest, you could, you know, you could feel the excitement building. These leaders, they would come to Congress and they would address a joint session and people were clapping just like it was a State of the Union address. Now you're thinking, oh, Dr. Trace, we're going to talk about that bad part. It's not going so well. Yeah. The area, I hate to admit, East Europe, Central and East Europe is an area where democracy is in retreat. It's not going so well. They're falling back into history, that old type history. For many of the same reasons that they did in the 1920s and 1930s. Anybody remember the first thing I said that was a problem? Can anybody think of any, any economic event that would have like shattered some of these modern East European countries? 
I hear people whispering, it just sounds almost like the right answer. Believe it or not, my college students do that sometimes. <laughs> Get old. What? The recession. The Great Recession. They had a Great Depression. I bet you didn't know this. Herbert Hoover coined the term Great Depression, or one of his advisors did, but he ran with it because he thought it sounded much better than panic. There's, there's a saying of Her Herbert Hoover. I mean, you know, he was a brilliant person. I mean, you know, he had a lot of great ideas. He was good at uh, you know, trying to help rebuild uh, countries after the war. But he was not one of the more fortunate politicians. The guy who designed the uh, Mount Rushmore said of Herbert Hoover, if you put a rose in his hand, it would wilt. <laughs> and I keep wondering the same thing when we say things like the Great Recession. What well, that was great about it. It was terrible for these countries, especially since they were following the Western model of democracy and free markets. That's a really bad time to have a new free market system, isn't it? I mean, it's bad enough for you know, a, a larger country that's far more self-sufficient, like us. But yeah, the Great Recession hit Europe just as bad, especially these new countries that were just trying to get their, just trying to get their foot. And it shattered their belief in free markets. Remember, many of these countries rebelled against communism because they thought free markets were the better op uh, were the better option. And this shook their faith in Western institutions of economic freedom. Because what happens when I mean you have all this freedom, and then your companies are going bankrupt, people are being unemployed. What do people want? They want stability. I mean, when you don't know where your next needle is coming from, you know, that's a very scary prospect. Eric Fromm, who was a sociologist, you know, he had a piece called Escape from Freedom. He was trying to explain why people would willingly choose authoritarianism. A lot of times it's because you're scared. You want stability. You would rather have someone tell you what to do and provide for you than fend for yourself in a lot of cases. I'm not seeing a lot of nods or smiles. You can at least understand it. <laughs> you know, America, we're, we're raised to be the exact opposite of that. But even in this country, can't you see how people would be a little, I mean, they were unnerved by the Great Recession. Seeing polls after polls saying that college students are more enamored with socialism and communism. But who's to say that's not something for all generations? In fact, polling research will show you the Great Recession scared everybody, not just college students. Anything else that was kind of similar to that era, something that rose in the 1920s and 30s that also intimidated East Europe? Russia. Well, what's Russia like today? Yeah, they're trying to make a comeback, just like everybody else. When I was over in Russia, I was there in 1993, 1994. Uh, Mexico was doing better economically. I mean, the place had I mean, they were going through their own Great Depression. They had a leader named Boris Yeltsin. When he got on to give, like, believe it or not, when they give a State of the Union address, like, which is going to happen, I don't know, with the shutdown, and it's looking, I guess they'll still do that. <laughs> Whenever, it's supposed to be like at the end of January, right? They do their State of the Union like, like right, at, right as midnight occurs at New Year. <laughs> I mean, everybody's watching. Like, everyone in the bars were all watching Boris Yeltsin giving a speech. It was in Russian, so I couldn't understand it. But I couldn't understand that everybody in the bar looked up at him, and they were all hissing angrily. That's evidently like booing. And I was like, ooh, this guy's the most pro-American leader we've had in a long time. Awkward. <laughs> yeah, Russia had, you know, Russia had collapsed. The economy had collapsed. Vladimir Putin came along in 1999, and he was promising people the same thing. You know, I'll rebuild it. Never forget that he's an ex-KGB agent. 
And never forget that when he called up his superiors at the KGB office for help, this is the end of the Gorbachev years, and they said, you're on your own to deal with those protesters outside. You know, he threatened to shoot all the protesters to scare them off. Never forget that. If he's not advocating communism, I mean, he doesn't stand behind a hammer and sickle. What does he stand for? Uh, himself. Okay, don't give me the correct answer. I tell these people sometimes. <laughs> Before you give me the correct answer, give me the popular culture, the, what we think of. <laughs> what kind of ism would it be? If we had to call it an ism other than so promoteism? Nationalism. Uh, Russia for the Russians. <laughs> Russia first. Yeah. And so that's what, who said uh, bring back the Soviet Union? Only it's, it's more like bringing back the Russian Empire, but the old Soviet borders. Anyone think of things he's specifically done to do that? <coughs> oh, Ukraine is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, took over parts of, uh, you know, two sections of Georgia. One of our students, by the way, was from the Republic of Georgia during this time. He had to let me know why he was going to be a little late to class. He was drafted into being, an, you know, basically a stretcher bearer for casualties. And I'm like, mm, hope you make it back safe. <laughs> we like having you in class. But that was a dangerous time. He will let you know a lot about what he thinks about that situation. Yeah, taking over parts of Georgia. You know, and then other countries like Belarus, almost like the way Austria went under Germany, without firing a shot, they absorbed all the countries. Those that resisted Hungary, <coughs> poisoning of opposition leaders, invasion. Does somebody say Crimea? Yeah. And, and that's in Crimea, just like uh, the way the Soviets would do to Afghanistan. This is, this is kind of, now you're an East European country. The guy is rebuilding everything in the Soviet Union. The West is focusing on rebuilding themselves from the Great Recession. They're not going to stick their necks out for you. And that's why most of these countries that we see are setting up nationalist authoritarian systems like they used to. It's true in the Czech Republic. It's more the case in Hungary. And in fact, Many of them are willing to, especially in Hungary's case, they will actually identify Russia as a friend. Oh, there's one other R I didn't get much to. Something else that happened in this era, <coughs> beginning with R. So they, uh, I would say it started around 2011, but by 2012, 2013. It did not happen in Europe, but it spread to Europe. Refugees from, oh yeah. Definitely Syria, Libya, North Africa. People fleeing these deadly conflicts. And the first destination they go to is East Europe. You've seen images of people trying to cut down wires and trying to get in. They're fleeing to this area. I got to meet some Syrian refugees when I was over in Turkey. And there's something to know about the refugees. The refugees are not the poorest people in Syria and Libya. They're professionals. They're wealthy. Some of them own businesses. Some are doctors, attorneys. It's the upper middle class. Why? They can afford it. They have the most to lose. They're the ones who are most likely to disagree with whatever dictator or new authority comes on in. Might question a group like ISIS. You're most likely to be a target. When these refugees are coming in, they're not, people aren't worried that they're just so poor that they're starving. No. People are worried that they're going to jump ahead of them. The Some of them have come in with money, but they definitely have come in with talent. And they worship a different religion. Even if it's a more liberalized version, it's a different one. Does this sound like anything that would have happened in the 20s and 30s? You had Jewish people, right? Weren't Jewish people seen as having a different religion? Being ahead in the game? Not native to Europe? They're supposed to be from like the Middle East or something? You could be in a place a long time and still be considered a refugee. There's still people in this town who think of me as a foreigner. <laughs> not native. Not 
love this thing. I really do. But there are some people, I, I had one person who I thought of was an ally. We were on TV and he called me a stranger. And I've been there, I was like, stranger? What the heck is that? Yeah, you know, okay, well, I'll decide to live in other places. But yeah. And these, and many of these nationalists have used refugees and populist arguments to take power. We've seen it in the Czech Republic and Hungary, even in Austria. You know, Austria is the first country to elect a leader who's a millennial. Yeah, I don't even think he's 30 years old. He's a populist. He's one of he's one of uh, he he's of the right of center party. He had listened to the neo Nazi party. Of course, they don't call themselves neo Nazi, like the you know, Peace and Freedom Party. Or but he had followed their arguments and he saw how popular this neo-Nazi party was. And so he co-opted a lot of those arguments. And that's how somebody under the age of 30 can win in Austria. So he's the chancellor of Austria. He doesn't look like he's capable of growing facial hair. <laughs> no, seriously, you ought, to, you ought to But he's using the same argument as those in East Europe have. In some cases, Russia. There also, there's something else I didn't get to, I should have mentioned, I'll just do it briefly, but keep in mind, what's the free market institution in Europe? The EU. How's it going for the EU? Good decade, bad decade. <laughs> I mean, it's seen as another casualty of the Great Recession. People are seeing it as the problem. This European government that's pushing uh, economic freedom, that's lowering trade barriers that's allowing people to move from one country to another. Because if those refugees can get into East Europe with a common passport, you could show up in Britain or France, could you not? Or Germany? And what are we seeing in those West European countries? Brexit. Brexit, okay. Which one? Resistance to refugees like France. Oh, yeah. And it's driving politics, too. Germany elected its first neo-Nazi party, AFD. They, you're supposed to get over a certain threshold, like 5%. The Nazis never could get over this. Now they've got 12% of parliament. In France, the far right, the National Front, the same types of, uh, you know, the same types of uh, ultra-conservatives that at one point were in charge in France during World War II, they made it to the runoff. Y'all follow this? It was uh, Marine Le Pen. And they elected another guy who also doesn't look like he has much facial hair. You know, he's like a technocratic wizard. He's also a pretty young guy. Uh, Macron wins the runoff. But that was kind of that was kind of scary. And how many times have we heard now that Russia may be behind some of the social media on Brexit, AFD, and helping out National Front, wherever they can. I remember somebody showed me a post. A posting, and it said, "You ever wonder what it would? What, you ever wonder like what you would have done in the 1920s and 1930s when you see stories about what happened just before World War II?" And said, so, "Congratulations, you're going to get that chance." I'm dead serious about. It. These are also concerns of the United States. We don't have to go over to Europe to study these things, right? We can see some elements of this in the United States. Am I correct? People scared about what happened with uh, recession. Russia, you know, people are divided, uh, the support for them or not. Refugee crisis. What's going to happen to this area? Are we going to see a breakup of this Cold War alliance, NATO? Are we going to have more countries break in? Are we going to join such a movement? I mean, it's, it's, on, it's, it's not just on younger people. It's, <laughs> you have to tell people, maybe you have to watch for this in like 10, 20 years. I mean, you, you watch for it happening now. What are we going to do? We have some of the same questions in this country. This event. Last slide. Those of you who are from First United Methodist Church, uh, remember Harold Lawrence, a uh, longtime pastor. He would always end with last story. 
I borrowed that from my classes so my students will know. <laughs> time, to, uh, time to skip out. They're very good at staying afterwards, believe it or not. It's not like I, the last word I say, they're running out as fast as they can. They like to stand around and chat. Because politics is sappy interesting. <laughs> I shouldn't say sappy interesting. Slovakia, the one we seem to have forgotten about, the one I haven't mentioned much, they may have figured it out. They had the hardest transition in the 1990s. They were the one of the ones who, when they broke uh, when they broke off, they had trouble with democracy. They had trouble with free market reforms. They had their own parties with ugly agendas. They had all that. But Slovakia has done something the last few years. They responded very differently. <clears throat> Whereas other countries you see powerful political parties consolidating authority, the Slovaks seem to be trying to split power so that no one party can dominate the system. They were late to the game, but I think they may have figured it out. And so the Slovaks are understanding that, same thing our founding fathers knew. You don't just create a government to pass a bunch of things, you also create a government that prevents a lot of bad things from being passed. I mean, if the founding fathers wanted to write, you know, the legislation that would allow everything to, to sail on through, we wouldn't have had two houses, we wouldn't have had the chance for divided government, we wouldn't have had uh, separate offices, we would have been like the British, who could pass anything they wanted to just before the Revolutionary War. And so the Slovaks have realized that divided government, which forces compromise, is not the worst thing ever. 